Hello, and welcome to Application of Multiparticulate Technologies for Drug Delivery, presented by American Pharmaceutical Review and sponsored by Capsigel. My name is Tamlin Oliver. I'm a managing editor at Compare Networks, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. Multiparticulate technologies enable solutions to a broad range of drug development and formulation challenges. Our speaker today will discuss several of those solutions as well as many of the benefits of multiparticulates. Before we get started, though, I'd like to remind you about the live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question at any time using the Q&A box on your screen. We also have several papers available for download during the webinar. You can find them in the resource box on the left of your screen. Um, before we get started, let me introduce today's speaker. Brett Waybrandt has worked at Capsigel Bend since 2014 as a research chemical engineer and product development lead. He, he received his PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota. His work focuses on multiparticulates, including lipid multiparticulates manufactured using the melt spray congeal process and spray layered multiparticulates. For more about Brett, you can check out his speaker bio. Um, Brett, now that we have all that preliminary stuff out of the way, we're ready for you to begin. Thank you for that introduction, Tamlin. Um, so I wanted to talk today a little bit about um, multi-particulates in general. Um, so, but first, before we get started, um, I want to uh, you know give a little bit of overview of the technology platforms available uh, at Capsigel. Um, so they, there's a pretty broad range, um, spanning from, you know, bioavailability enhancement, including SDDs, um, all the way through um, some specialized applications, uh, including like taste masking and pediatric applications. Um, today we're going to focus mostly on multi-particulate technologies, uh, which falls kind of under the, the targeted release platforms. But um, uh, the key here is, is showing. Um, Capsigel has a broad range of technologies and solutions available to suit the target product profile or, or the needs of the particular um, uh, particular particular problem statement. So I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of the presentation today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be focusing mostly on multi-particulates. Uh, so I'm going to start a little bit on some of the drivers for using multi-particulate. Um, both market drivers and kind of a regulatory and even economic drivers uh, for, for using this particular technology. Um, I wanted to go over a little bit of the criteria for why you would choose a multi-particulate, um, especially in contrast to a more traditional uh, dosage form such as a tablet. Um, and then we'll get into a little bit more detail into some uh, specific multi-particulate technologies, uh, specifically extrusion sphere spherinization, uh, mini tabs, um, fluid, fluid bed layered uh, multi-particulates, and then uh, we'll go into a little bit more in depth into um, the MSCLMP or melt spray congeal uh, lipid multi-particulate technologies, uh, which is a, a specialty here at, at Capsigel Bend. Finally, we'll end the presentation with uh, a case study looking at um, a couple examples uh, that, of projects that we've successfully executed um, using multi-particulate technologies. When you tend to think of uh, kind of a traditional solid, solid dosage, uh, oral, uh, sorry, uh, uh, oral solid dosage form, um, tablets typically come to mind. Um, and essentially, what a multi-particulate is is just one of those uh, a monolithic tablet broken up into many discrete, many discrete particles. Um, and you know, multi-particulates come in many forms, um, and they can be called by several different names. Uh, you'll hear them referred to as particles, pellets, uh, beads, granules, and even mini tablets. Um, traditionally, though, they're, they're small, discrete units um, in, with, with a particle size range of uh, uh, down to about 100 microns up to a few mil, uh, millimeters in size. Um, and they're produced by various processes, including fluid bed coating, um, extrusion, furinization, and melt spray congeal, um, and then also uh, tableting. So we'll get into a little bit more detail about some of those uh, specific um, processes uh, later in this presentation. So why use multi-particulates over a tablet? Um, there, there's a number of reasons. Um, ex one of the, the big drivers is multi-particulates tend to have a little bit less vari variation in bioavailability um, due to more consistent transit times through the GI tract. Um, furthermore, they also tend to find a little bit more specialized use in, in patient populations, particularly those that have difficulty swallowing, like pediatric and geriatric populations. 
Um, we see quite a few problem statements come through here uh, with, with that particular use in mind. Uh, Multiparticulars are also used very frequently in modified release applications. Um, they're extremely uh, a flexible and versatile dosage form and able to support a pretty wide range of release profiles. Um, additionally, multiparticulars have a pretty low risk of dose dumping. Um, and th this is in contrast to a tablet. Um, you know, multiparticulates are very discrete, many, many particles. So, um, a particular, you know, depending on the dosage form, um, you could have anywhere from up to, you know, 10 mini tabs, up to several hundred thousand multi-particulates uh, multi or LMPs. Um, so the advantage this, this gives is if there is a, a, a defect in, in the coding, particularly for controlled release, um, really we only, you, you don't end up with a catastrophic failure. Um, this is in contrast to a tablet where, you know, should there be a, a defect in the coding or defect in the tablet, you could potentially um, expose the patient to a very high dose very rapidly. Um, or the patient doesn't receive a dose at all if, if, if the coding fails. Um, so that's one of the big drivers for multi-particulate, especially when um, dealing with modified release um, um, profiles. So I want to get a little bit into the reasons for why using um, multi-particulates and, and some of the economic drivers here. Um, so the, the graphic on the left kind of shows uh, some of the advantages of multi-particulates over um, monolithic dosage forms. Um, we had covered a couple of them on the previous slides, including the, the kind of consistent gastric residence, um, the flexibility in dosage formats, and, and, and the reduced risk of dose dumping. Um, however, there's uh, also several other economic and regulatory drivers as well. Um, multi-particulates uh, have a... Um, are very amenable to the 505D pathways and patent extensions, uh, patent extension um, pathways uh, as, as some of the regulatory drivers. Um, however, probably the majority of problem statements we see regarding multi-particulates typically involve specialized patient populations. Um, pediatrics are really the major driver. Um, young children are much better able to take multi-particulates um, because they are small and the patients are better able to swallow the dosage form compared to a tablet. Um, these problem statements come through due to the regulatory requirements of the FDA um, where a lot, and, and the EMA where um, a pediatric plan is often required uh, for the launch of the adult program. Um, there's also some economic drivers involved as well, um, specifically around the pediatric exclusivity uh, for mar marketing the adult version of the drug. Um, so we see quite a few uh, um, um, problem statements related to both this uh, economic and regulatory driver. We also seen some multi-particulates multi used for some other select patient populations, um, particularly geriatrics, um, and even some cancer-based in, in indications um, where the patients have trouble swallowing kind of the, the traditional tablet uh, monolithic dosage form. So listed here uh, are just a couple examples of multi-particulates uh, currently used in commercial products. Um, this is just nine of, of many. Um, the, the key here, the key point here is that multi-particulates are not a particularly exotic dosage form. Um, they're very well established across the pharmaceutical industry. So if you looked at the previous slide carefully, you could see a couple um, final dosage form present, uh, presentations. Um, and it really highlights kind of the flexibility of multi-particulates. Um, a lot of the different presentations address compliance issues around pediatric and geriatric populations, such as suspensions, sprinkle caps, and sachets. Um, the presentations like suspensions and sprinkle caps are, are nice because they offer multiple dosage strengths using a single multi-particulate formulation. Um, so for example, with, with sprinkle caps, um, we filled capsules to various fill weights, uh, and then by mixing and matching those different fill weights of the capsules, you can actually deliver a very wide range of dosage, uh, doses to the patient. Um, so this is an advantage because you don't necessarily have to reformulate uh, for different dosage strengths. And it also gives uh, very good granularity, um, especially for younger patients where um, there's a very big disparity in size between patients. Um, so it allows you to get a very specialized um, and personalized dose. Um, another important point to, um, thing to point out here as, is with multi-particulates, you're also able to deliver very, very high doses uh, of, of the 
of the dosage form um, due to the good mouthfeel and flowability of the multi-particulates. Um, so we've encountered several problem statements over the year um, where we're looking to deliver multiple grams of API um, or even multiple up to 10 plus grams of, of multi-particulates. So you're able to do that with multi with the multi particulates um, due to that good mouthfeel. Uh, they suspend pretty well in a liquid, and you're able to uh, drink a, a, a very large dose. So I wanted to focus a little bit more on the pediatric dosing, uh, mostly because it's a pretty major driver for products um, that we see for multi particulates coming through. Um, so multi particulates are used a lot for children because they can reliably be taken um, by young folk as, as young as six months old and potentially even younger. Um, so there's a really excellent review on pediatric um, oral dosage forms um, by Ministry and, and Bachelor out of the University of Birmingham in the UK. Um, and basically they, they did a, re a thorough review of the literature and showed um, that multi particulates were pretty well tolerated for patients as young as three months. Um, so this is pretty consistent with Kind of the feedback we're receiving from our clients as well, um, where multi particulates, uh, especially the, the smaller multi particulates like LMPs and, and spray layered um, dispersions or, or spray layered multi particulates, um, are actually really, really well tolerated by, by children of all ages. Um, a key feature of the multi particulates really is the ability to add taste masking, um, either through functional coating or kind of through the inherent nature of, of the multi particulates. Uh, the review I mentioned uh, actually showed that multi-particulates can actually have a preference over oral liquids, um, and a lot of this preference was attributed to the taste. So multi-particulates are inherently taste neutral, um, and taste masking can be added to hide the bitter or unpleasant APIs. Um, the, you know, kind of the main complaint that you know, we hear and, and see in the literature against multi-particulates is it tend to be a little bit of a gritty texture, especially for the larger particles. Um, however, from what we've observed and seen in the literature, um, this kind of texture really isn't a major barrier to taking the, the dosage form um, and actually has benefits over um, an oral uh, liquid if, if there are taste issues. Um, so this slide here, I wanted to take a little bit of a sidebar um, and, and kind of talk about our, our approach for how we um, come about uh, uh, problem statements that come through. Um, so a lot of it starts with assessing the target product profile. Um, so really it's key to understand the performance aspects of the API and the target patient population to really allow us to select the right dosage form um, to pursue in development. So a couple examples of things that we consider are shown here in, in the graphic. Uh, for example, delivering the required release profile, um, whether it be releasing immediate in the stomach or in the intestines, uh, is, is key for performance. But we also consider other um, issues such as excipient set safety and levels, especially in the pediatric population. Um, other things are, is taste masking required? Um, really looking at what is the, the patient um, population and how does that affect palatability or usability of the final dosage form. A lot of these factors kind of go into the technology selection because getting the technology right is key to achieving the achieving the target product profile. So um, this slide here kind of highlights some of the, the technologies or multi-particulate technologies that Capsule has, has expertise in. Um, so I kind of showed the broader Capsule Gel technologies on the opening slide, uh, and this kind of delves down into a little bit deeper into the particular um, multi-particulate dosage form um, technologies. So we were able to cover a pretty broad range of problem statements, ranging from taste masking to solubility enhancement. Um, and even controlled and, and delayed release. Um, and we'll talk about um, several of these technologies um, later, in the, later on in the presentation. But mostly what I wanted to get across here is that these technologies really allow us to tackle complicated problem statements and really tailor a development program to the specific target, target product profile. Um, basically, we're, we're, we're going to make sure that the technology that we use uh, to solve your dosage form problems um, 
is really right for that particular problem statement. We're going to transition a little bit um, and start focusing on these technologies a little bit more in depth. Um, over the next few slides, we'll be talking about um, extrusion spherinization, multi-tab, spray layered multi-particulates, and then I'm going to go into a lot more detail on lipid multi-particulates, both in their formulation and processing. Uh, finally, we'll conclude with some case studies about uh, on some various multi-particulate projects that we've um, we've, we've uh, encountered. So I want to start off with extrusion spherinization. Um, extrusion spherinization. Extrusion spherinization is a technique that allows for really high drug loading, um, and those high drug loadings are used with some of our unconventional excipients. Um, it allows for ex excellent particle size control. Uh, with particles ranging from on the low end of about 0.6 millimeters up to about 1.2 millimeters. Um, both immediate release and modified release systems are, are, are uh, capable with this technology. Um, and the control to release can be achieved both through matrix um, formulation systems and also through barrier coatings. Um, so the basic process around extrusion spherinization starts with kind of a traditional dry mixing um, Step where the excipients and API are, are blended together. Um, next is the wet massing process where water or other um, solvent is mixed with a binder, um, trying to basically making a wet dough. Um, followed by that process, uh, that, that material is then extruded through um, a screen, forming these long, uh, essentially spaghetti noodle like um, um, a mass. Um, next, that mass is then put into a spherinizer where um, it's basically rotated on a spinning disc, uh, and those, those long spaghetti noodles essentially are broken up into small little spheres um, and, and brought down to the, the proper size. Uh, finally, those spheres are dried of that solvent, typically water, um, and then that can additionally, additional functionality can be added through fluid bed coating. Moving on a little bit here, we're talk now we're talking about multi-tablets um, multi or multi-tabs. Um, so multi-tabs are clinical uh, small particles, typically on the order of two to three millimeters, um, that are produced using kind of a conventional tableting machine, uh, so a, a traditional rotary press. Um, uh, basically, the only modification that has to happen for the rotary press is, is to use a special die that's, that's uh, specific for the, the, multi uh, the mini tablet. Um, additional things about the, the mini tab is that they can easily be coated um, to add additional functionality, either using a pan coater or the fluid bed. Um, and additionally, solubilized API can use, so an FDD can be put into the blend um, and, and compressed directly into the mini tab. So it has some um, solubility enhancement characteristics as well. Mini tablets have many, many of the same advantages as multi particulates in terms of the risk of dose dumping, uh, GI transit times, and swallowability. Um, infants and young children are able to take mini tabs. Um, again, they're only about two to three millimeters in size, and, and they are able to, to consume them. Um, however, it does become problematic when large number of mini tablets need to be dosed. Um, so, typically, if, if the number of mini tablets is small, you know, on the order of 10 to 20, young young children are able to take that. Um, as soon as you get into larger doses, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, the other issue that often arises with mini tablets is young children have a tendency to chew on them, um, which can certainly be problematic if, if there's a, a modified release dosage form, um, particularly if there's, if there's a coating. Um, so the process for actually making mini tablets is, is pretty similar to the traditional tableting process in terms of blending, granulating, and pressing. Um, the only kind of additional requirements is that to require the blend to flow really well. Um, the blend has to fill a, a very small die cavity, um, and so so that that's one of the requirements um, of that particular blend. Um, the coating itself, if you need to add additional functionality, is relatively straightforward. Again, you can add taste masking or modified release coating. Um, they, the coating can either be done in, in a pan coater or a fluid bed. Um, we have had issues in the past when um, using a fluid bed for, for mini tablet coating, in particular on friability, um, but usually that re just requires a little bit of feedback with when 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 doing the tablet tableting um, to make sure the hardness is in, in is the tablet hardness is um, strong enough to survive the, the fluid bed coating process. 
So the mini tabs can then eventually be packaged either into capsules or sachets for the final dosage form presentation. Um, so moving on to, to spray layered multi particulates. Um, you know, spray layered multi particulates, multi -particulates are a particularly attractive technology, um, especially when you need to combine the flexibility of, of the multi particulate along with solubility enhancement. Um, so there's there's kind of two techniques that um, are often used. Um, the API can be dissolved in the solvent along with a, a polymer um, that is either used as a binder or a, a crystallization and a pre precipitation enhancer. Um, the other possibility is is um, milling the API um, to su sufficiently small particle size, um, mixing it with a binder, uh, and then spray layering it on to a inert core, uh, typically microcrystalline cellulose or, or sucrose. Um, and that process is usually done in a, a fluid bed coater. Um, the advantages here is you get that solubility enhancement with the multi particulate. Um, and in, in addition, you can also add additional functionality relatively easily in the, the fluid bed coater, um, either through modified release layers or case masking uh, is, is relatively simple to achieve. So I want to take a quick little sidebar here to discuss the additional functionality um, that can be done by fluid bed coating. It doesn't quite fit into um, the multi-particulate dosage forms, but it is an important piece. Um, most of the, the dosage forms we're talking about here can be easily um, modified through fluid bed coating. Um, so we see a lot of problem statements come through with this particular um, um, issue, whether it be a taste masking uh, uh, issue or um, wanted to add some controlled or delayed release or even fix those combination um, products can be um, readily achieved on multi-particulates through this fluid bed coating functionality. Um, so, you know, typically we'll see the lipid multi-particulates, which we'll get to in a little bit, um, pellets, et cetera, are easily coated. Uh, and then, as I mentioned a couple slides ago, um, mini tabs can either be done in, in the fluid bed or um, on the a, a traditional pan coater. Um, so the, a couple options here that, that are displayed, um, I mentioned before, the case masking. Um, this, this particular functionality comes in a lot with pediatrics um, where you are trying to mask the taste of a, of a um, either bitter or uh, API that, that, that burns. Uh, controlled release um, typically is uh, achieved through a, a diffusional barrier, um, you know, and we can achieve uh, controlled release over anywhere from two to eight hours is readily available through, through coatings. Um, pH trigger, uh, there's a lot of problem statements for, for enteric coating uh, if you, you know, want to release post the stomach um, or even kind of a targeted release uh, issue where, where you want to have the, the drug released later in the, in the intestine. Uh, it's relatively easy to add a pH sensitive polymer coat to these multi particulates to try and um, modify the target of the release. Um, additionally, I mentioned if, if there is a particular need for a fixed dose combination, um, particularly if uh, the two, drug, two drugs are incompatible. Um, it's possible to have uh, API in the core, uh, maybe either through the LMP or, or other technology, uh, and then add an additional um, drug layer on the outside so that can mitigate some of the um, issues around um, compatibility between APIs. I want to get more here in depth um, on lipid multi lipid multi-particulate technologies. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more um, about uh, how they're made and how they're formulated. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we'll conclude the, the talk with a, a, a short little case study um, of, of some projects that we've done. Um, so lipid multi-particulates, kind of what are they? Um, so lipid uh, LMPs, you'll hear me refer to them, probably constantly using that moniker. Um, they're smooth, round, uh, crystalline multi-particulates that are produced from a solvent-free melt process. Um, so LMPs have preference, uh, precedence for compliance. Uh, we see a lot of problem statements around the pediatric here um, because they are small. We're able to control the particle size very tightly and reproducibly, um, and they have pretty good mouth feels. Um, the multi-particulate format also allows for the personalized dose, uh, so you're able to get a very specific dose depending on um, Person to person uh, variability uh, using a single dosage form and single dosage form strength. 
Um, we'll get into a little bit more details here, but LMPs are produced from the melt spray congealed process, um, which does have commercial precedent. So the Z-Max um, azithromycin antibiotic is, is produced through this uh, LMP uh, or melt spray congealed process. Um, flexibility, so we're able to get both high and low drug loadings down from uh, on the low end of about 5% all the way up to 60% can really be coded um, and, and can be readily coded for additional functionality. Uh, and this kind of flexibility in terms of, of loading is, is really valuable um, because you can hit both the adult and, and pediatric population. So if you do require either high potent compounds um, or um, going after very uh, uh, small children, you're able to get um, very low loadings. Um, on the contrast, if you are trying to target an adult population, you can achieve very high drug loadings to get the, the overall amount of material delivered, um, the final LMP dose, uh, into a, a reasonable range. Um, finally, uh, you still get some of the multi-particulate benefits um, in terms of um, pediatric compliance, um, either through a su suspension sachet or capsule fill. Uh, and then you also get some of the multi-particulate advantages around um, safety and the um, intestinal distribution. So this is kind of a high-level slide here um, around the benefits of lipid multi-particulates, um, really kind of around the lifestyle, life cycle management um, model. Um, so I hit on, hit on a couple of these in the previous slide. Um, but I wanted to highlight, uh, you know, with, with the lipid multi-particulates, um, basically a single presentation um, accommodates a really wide range of doses. Um, we're able to hit both the pediatric populations and also the adult in a, a single form. Um, it's a, a fairly uniform development path for uh, especially niche or, or low-volume products. Um, and one of the, the big values here is that, um, it, as we'll get into a little bit more detail later, um, it's a very... Uh, easy scale up from feasibility all the way through um, phase three and even beyond. Um, and, and we'll get into the details there. Um, but it really helps, uh, especially for those, those nature low volume products where um, you don't have to go through additional development cycles uh, as you progress through, through the, the clinical trial. Um, so this is just a little bit more details on the lipid multi-particulate um, platforms. Um, I won't, won't hit all of these, but um, I, I want to hit a, on a couple of key points. Um, the, the ability to use uh, a, a wide variety of compounds in this particular dosage form is, is, is very attractive. Um, the, the drug remains crystalline throughout the entire process, um, so it really mitigates a lot of stability concerns that, that um, arise through uh, amorphous uh, dispersion. Um, you have a lot of tunable release characteristics. Um, so, a uh, formulation space for immediate and modified release. Um, they're relatively easy to swallow. And again, I, I hit on this a couple times already, but um, it's appropriate for all ages, all the way down from, from pediatric all the way to geriatric um, patient populations. Um, it's very amenable at downstream processing. So, these particles are very robust, um, really low friability, so they're able to be coated. Um, and that really comes in when you want to do modified release or even a, a, a taste masking. Um, type, type problem statements. And then dose flexibility. So uh, you can deliver a wide range of doses um, with, with a single uh, formulation. So this slide here really kind of highlights kind of our, our approach for um, attacking a problem statement, so a lot of the technology selection. Um, so uh, the, the figure on the left kind of shows the sweet spot for LMP technology uh, for the immediate release. Um, these kind of technology maps are something we rely, rely on quite heavily. Um, the idea is, is leverage the previous experience um, to try and get to that uh, ideal formulation relatively quickly um, without having to go through a lot of iterations in, in development. Um, the, the formulation map kind of on the right um, kind of shows our, our approach to getting the, the formulation right. Um, basically, what we, we're looking at is API characteristics, in particular API solubility, um, and kind of the, the target release rate uh, to set that initial formulation. So if, if we are going for kind of a, a modified release or, or controlled release system, um, you'll see we have, we, we'll, we'll select excipients with relatively low water permeability 
um, and that really limits the, the dissolution rate and slows that um, release down. Um, if we are looking for immediate release, um, particular characteristics, we'll use the high permeability matrix, and we'll get a little bit more details on, on what we're actually doing here. Um, but the, the, the couple key points I wanted to hit on um, is that we can use actually a really relatively broad range of excipients. Um, the, the matrix material is typically a, a, a wax-based substance, so we'll, we'll use a lot of um, hard fats or, or um, um, fatty alcohols. Um, we can also accommodate a, quite a broad range of, of, of other excipients. So, uh, for example, um, we've been able to formulate um, multi-particulates with, you know, up to up to 50% oil. So, if there is a, a API that does have oil solubility, we can incorporate that as well. Um, it's pretty high drug loading. Um, the other thing that is, is worth noting out here is that these formulations really don't require any preservatives. Um, we're using mostly hydrophobic excipients. Um, so the, the water content is exceedingly low, uh, which reduces the risk for, for microbial. Um, you know, this, this is one of the big benefits over of, of lipid multi-particulates over, um, say, oral uh, uh, liquids that, that do require preserve, preservatives, especially for the pediatric population where, um, you know, those preserve, preserve the preservatives are, are looked down upon by some of the regulatory bodies. Um, additionally, most of the matrix that we use typically have pretty good safety profiles and precedence, um, which is obviously precedence, which is obviously a necessity when looking at the, the pediatric population. So um, I kind of want to get into the, the dissolution mechanism here for as, as you know, target release rate is, is one of the key product profiles in, in most dosage forms. Um, so the way the drug releases from these LMPs is, is basically through aqueous diffusion through a porous matrix. Um, one of the ways we kind of um, visualize it is, is um, movement of water through a tidal pool, um, and that's illustrated by that image, the image on the left. Um, essentially, uh, what happens here, uh, if, if you kind of think of the mechanism, the release mechanism is, is as soon as the LMP is, is exposed to water, um, First thing that happens is, is uh, a pore former that we add to try and in, in, increase the water diffusion rate starts to dissolve. Um, that water then diffuses into the core through those pores and also through the, the, the matrix material. Um, the API is then dissolved uh, and then the API diffuses out um, or is pumped out of the LMP through um, an osmotic pressure in, inside the core. Um, so those different steps are maybe rate controlling depending on um, which system we're, we're operating in. Um, but the, the key thing here is under, getting a, a good understanding or a physical model of the dissolution rate really helps drive uh, our formulation selection. Um, so shown here is just a, a couple of cool pictures of, of that dissolution mechanism in, in, in time. Um, so as these are cross sections of LMPs that have been exposed to the dissolution media um, at various time points and then cross sections in image. Um, and what you really see is that API, uh, the, the holes in the LMP um, as that API dissolves and, and uh, uh, enters into the dissolution bath, um, it, it really highlights the, the mechanism of, of dissolution that I discussed on the previous slide. Um, in addition to understanding kind of the, the dissolution mechanism, um, uh, here, here's where we're really understanding what controls that. Um, so here's a couple graphs looking at um, how the impact of formulation and particle size uh, really changes that dissolution rate. Um, so the, the image on the upper left, or the plot on the upper left, um, is looking at how the uh, amount of dissolution enhancer or former affects the dissolution rate. Um, essentially, that dissolution enhancer is, is increasing the permeability of the multi-particulate to um, water. Um, so as you increase the amount of, of pore former, um, water penetration is faster, uh, it leads to a, a, a quicker release profile. Um, the image on the, the plot on the, the lower left is looking at particle um, API size. Um, again, this gets at the, the, the step of, of API dissolution. Um, as you get smaller and smaller API particles, um, you see an increase in, in, dis or increase in dissolution rate, um, again, because that step of API dissolution becomes um, less rate limiting. 
Um, similarly, the, the plot on the, the lower right um, shows the effect of LMP particle size. So um, this really is a surface area effect. Uh, so as you get um, smaller and smaller particles, the surface area to volume increases and you get an increase in dissolution rate. Uh, and then finally, the, the plot on the upper right really looks at um, the effect of API solubility. Um, so for this particular example, the, the API was acid soluble. Um, so as you uh, increase the amount of um, basic excipients, you lower the solubility, um, slowing down the dissolution rate. So really the, the key point here is that you know, having that in-depth understanding of which factors impact the dissolution rate is really key to achieving the target fire profile. Um, I, I want to hit real quickly on kind of the LMP process train here. Um, so it, it really starts off by uh, either uh, extrusion or, or uh, melt tank. So essentially the, the excipients, the liquid excipients in the API are, are mixed together um, in a blend uh, and then run through an extruder. Uh, the extruder kind of does two things. Uh, it it um, heats up the excipients and melts them and then also provides mixing. And so you have a well-mixed system. Um, it then gets uh, processed on the melt spray congeal unit, which is essentially a rotary atomizer, um, as shown by the, the graphic on the, the lower left. Um, essentially, the, the melt, the liquid melt is put onto the spinning disk, uh, and that spinning disk atomizes it, turns it into small particles, uh, and then they congeal inside of the, the um, processing unit where they're collected at the bottom. Um, a couple additional process steps are sieving and fluid bed coating. Um, you know, if, if we are looking for a particular product uh, size, um, we can rapidly uh, remove the fines and the large particles, um, which helps with fluid bed coating. Um, we typically only sieve only if we're, we're adding a functional coating, uh, and typically is not required for um, non-coated LMPs. Um, finally, the, the lipid multi-particulates are then encapsulated either in capsule sachet or, or other final dosage form um, format. Um, so a little bit of uh, design and processing considerations. Um, you know, here at, at Capsule Bend, uh, we have a broad range of, of um, um, manufacturing equipment, all the way down from the laboratory scale, uh, which can do on the order of 20 grams for the feasibility stage, um, all the way up to uh, the commercial unit um, that can do batch sizes on the order of hundreds of kilograms. Um, here, here we typically run in that 20. 20 gram to up to uh, uh, one to two kilo range in feasibility, um, but the ability to go to large commercial scales is available as well. Um, so I do want to touch on a little bit of the actual physics of atomization and, and congealing. Um, so I touched a little bit about how um, these things are actually atomized, um, but a, a little more detail here. Um, you know, first what happens is that liquid melts, so the lipids in the API, um, is, is basically dropped onto the center of a, a rotating disk, as shown by the graphics on the left. Um, what happens there is the, the, the melt hits the disk and is accelerated by centrifugal forces outwards. It, it actually kind of spirals out um, in, a, in a, a spiral shape towards the edge of the disk. Uh, and then once it hits the edge of the disk, it's then flung off um, and atomized uh, through a couple different mechanisms. Um, we'll get a little bit more detail into the atomization mechanisms later. Um, but you can either have direct droplet where um, these LMP, the, the droplets of, of um, melt each of form directly on the disc and are shot off, um, or they, they fly off in these ligament patterns um, and then break up into the individual droplets through uh, Raleigh instabilities and then uh, enter into the congealing phase. Um, We'll get a little bit more into detail about understanding uh, uh, why we want to be in a particular atomization regime um, on the next slide. Um, next, what happens is, is kind of understanding the congealing process. Uh, essentially, it's an exercise in heat transfer. Um, so as these things come off the disk, uh, they're still in the liquid state, and they need to con cool and congeal into a sol solid particle um, before striking the edge of the, the process container. Um, so if, if the particles aren't fully congealed, um, they'll end up uh, having flat faces or, or splatting. They won't be uh, spherical. Um, so the key here is, is really understanding um, that, that heat transfer. Uh, this heat transfer process is actually what limits the upper particle size of these LMPs. So typically, um, you know, particles larger than about 400 microns uh, are very, very difficult to congeal. And essentially what's happening here um, 
is uh, you're basically fighting heat transfer as, as a function of, of particle size. So um, the heat transfer is, is basically a surface area effect where as you go up in particle size, uh, the heat transfer only goes up by the radius squared, um, but the total amount of mass that needs to be cooled increases by the cube. Um, so as you get to larger and larger particle size, it becomes increasingly difficult uh, to congeal these things before they hit hit the processing container. Uh, and that's really what limits the, the particle size. So typically for LMPs, we're looking in the sweet spot around uh, 100 to about 300, 350 uh, microns in size. Um, so this, this slide here is, is really showing us our showing our dedication and, and, and interest in really understanding the fundamental um, process of, of atomization. Um, so atomization is, is a key process to or is a is a key step in the process to ensure uh, robustness and, and scale up. So really understanding how these LMPs are formed um, is, is key throughout the, the life cycle of the development. Um, the image on the lower left is, is a, a really good one showing um, what we want to see, where you have the melt hitting the center of the disc, um, spiraling outward, uh, and then forming these long ligaments off the edge. Uh, and then those long lig ligaments are what break up into the droplet. Um, there are several different regimes, as noted here. We're not going to go into the details of, of which regime, and, you know, what processing conditions result in which regime. Um, the key here is, is to show that, uh, you know, this is something that we, we look at very directly. It, it's tied to the science of scale and understanding um, how the process works. And this really drives, um, you know, de-risking from early feasibility all the way through uh, phase three and beyond. I did want to show a couple real-world examples of, of um, the MSC process in terms of particle size and, and reproducibility. Um, so the LMP particle size is directly controlled by the speed of the disk. Um, as you go up in disk speed, uh, you tend to get smaller particles. As you decrease disk speed, um, you tend to get larger particles. Um, we are able to very um, specifically control the particle size range um, based on this disk speed. Uh, so if you look on the, the plot on the lower left, it shows um, how we're able to control particle size just by varying the disk speed. Uh, the, the plot on the right shows uh, kind of the reproducibility. So once we do understand the system, um, it is very, very robust. We're able to get very, very good reproducibility um, between runs. Um, and then uh, we also get a very tight particle size distribution. So um, typical spans are on the order of, of 0.7. Um, and then we can get, uh, if you are fluid bed coating, uh, we can get particle sizes uh, the, the yield between 150 and 350 microns in the 80 and 90 range, um, and then upwards of 95% if you're looking at um, kind of a 150 to 355 or 350 micron particle size. So I wanted to conclude um, with just a couple examples or case studies of, of problem statements that we've 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 seen. Um, we can't go into too much detail due to client privilege, um, but it does show kind of the span and the breadth of problem statements that we observe. Um, so everywhere from case masking, which is, is very common, especially in pediatric um, applications, uh, to controlled release, um, or even enteric protection or, or problem statements we see regularly. Um, you also see that we look at some high and low loadings, um, you know, less than 10% active to up to 60% active in these LMPs, uh, a lot of that really is driven by the, the active dose and also the patient population. Uh, and then finally, we're able to handle both uh, um, low solubility and high solubility drugs. So um, for example, um, some of the, the drugs we work with have, have solubilities of, in the microgram range for, for LMPs. Uh, and then additionally, we can work with um, you know, either the spray layered uh, multi-particulates or even mini tabs. And this solubility enhancement is, is one of the keys for the product. So I want to conclude the talk um, with a little bit of an overview. Um, you know, Multi-particulate multi technologies um, are, are a growing market application, um, largely through pediatrics and also the 505B2 pathways. 
uh, really key drivers. Um, the, the main takeaway here is that multi-particulates are, are highly flexible, um, both in achieving the, the target release profile, um, but also in the final dosage form format. Um, so it's able to accommodate both solubilized active ingredients, um, for example, spray layer dispersions, if you're looking at um, mini tabs or direct solubilization in the case of spray layered um, spray layered multi particulates. Uh, taste masking is a is a is a big key here um, due to the ability to add additional flexibility or functionalization through uh, fluid bed coating or, or pan coating in the case of in the case of uh, mini tabs. Um, and then uh, you know kind of that technology selection piece. Um, you know when do you use multi particulates over more traditional um, monolithic tablet uh, is really key on on the API characteristics uh, and really driven by that uh, uh, target product profile of the drug. So different aspects that you need. Um, and then finally, uh, the melt spray congeal process um, is highly amenable to uh, multi particulate applications, especially pediatric populations. With that, I want to thank thank you and, and turn it over to Tamlin for the question and answer session. All right. Uh, thanks for the informative presentation, Brett, and great job persevering through the, some technical difficulties. Um, before we start the Q&A, we just have a quick question. We hope that you'll take a minute and answer. Um, would you like Cap to gel to follow up with you after the webinar? If you could just answer that, then we can continue on and get right to our Q&A. We have a lot of good questions already. And uh, if you haven't submitted any questions, uh, please do so now, because Brett is available to answer your questions. All right, Brett, uh, the first question is, uh, can you elaborate why multi-particulate affords a high dose versus conventional tablet or capsule? Are they the same or different drug loading? Yeah, so multi-particulates can, can afford a high dose um, in, in two different ways. First, um, you can get relatively high dosing within the LMP itself. Um, so in particular with, with lipid multi-particulates, and we've had loadings of, of up to 60% drugs, so the actual multi-particulate itself is, is, is mostly API. Um, the other advantage here is, is that um, you, it's, it's relatively easy to take large doses. Um, so because they do have good mouthfeel uh, and there's, there's alternative ways to administer the drug, uh, particularly through um, suspensions or, or liquid dosing, um, it's relatively easy to take um, a, a very large dose at once. Um, by dispersing in, in water or liquid, um, rather than taking, you know, a large number of pills, um, you know, that whole dose is distributed over, you know, up, up to 10,000 particles at once. So it makes it a lot easier to, to consume um, um, very large doses of, of the multi-particulates. Okay. Um, thanks for that. The next one is, what would be the minimal sphere size achieved by extrusion spheronization? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So um, typically with extrusion spherinization, um, the low end is on the 0.8 to 1 micro, uh, 0.8 to 1 millimeter size. Um, it is possible to go smaller in particles, um, but it's it's a little bit of a risk in terms of of how do you formulate it, and and it's additional risk in terms of process robustness. Um, so you know, typically we're looking at a, a minimum size of around. 0.6 millimeters for extrusion spherinization. Okay, the, Brett, the next question is, um, how do you guarantee that the API is always crystalline with no amorphous portion? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question, um, especially for lipid multi-particulates. Um, so, you know, one of the, the making sure that the API stays crystalline is, is key, uh, mostly for um, both reliability in terms of, of release rate, um, but additionally for stability. Um, so amorphous API tends to have additional stability risk because it's more likely to, to change um, either drug form or um, um, increase the risk of, of impurities. Um, so typically how we guarantee amorphous is, is through drug screening. Um, so early on in the process, uh, we're, we're looking at, at how the drug and the um, let the matrix interact, uh, mostly as a, a function of process temperatures. Um, so typically what we do is we'll mix the API and, and the proposed formulation together, um, heat that at uh, uh, processing temperatures for 
um, a designated uh, designated time. Um, and then what we'll do is, is look uh, through um, typically PXRD or other physical character characterization techniques um, and see if, if that drug has changed form or has morphed in, in, and dissolved into the, the um, lipid matrix. Basically, what we do is, is we do a kind of a solubility screen. Um, so we'll take the drug and, and observe and see how much of it um, dissolves into our proposed formulation. Um, if we do see a relatively high solubility of that API in the lipid, um, we, we traditionally flag it as a risk and, and look a little bit more closely to see how um, that amorphous fraction affects um, stability and, and, and drug reli uh, release rate. Uh, or what we'll do is we'll look at alternative formulations where the API is, is less soluble in the recipient. Okay, Brett, the next question is, can LMP be used for injection? Yeah, that's, that's another really good question. Um, so typically, uh, you know, at least in our experience, we have not seen LMP used for injection in, in humans. Um, however, there is precedent for um, LMPs as injection in animal health. Um, that's, there's a couple problem statements, and I think there's a couple of commercial products out there that currently use um, LMPs as, as an injectable, um, particularly for um, uh, you know a long-term modified release or in, in, injectable. Um, the key for uh, injectables is really particle size control and, and terminal sterilization. Um, so making sure the particle size stays small. Um, so you can get through the needle is, is key, uh, and then also making sure that that material is, is sterile, obviously, is a, is a, a rather obvious constraint. Um, so getting that terminal sterilization is a, is a key consideration um, during development. All right, Brett, I have another LMP question. What is the stability of the LMP under tropical, or ICH, for storage conditions? Is the physical stability and release profile maintained? Yeah, that's another fantastic question. Um, so yeah, uh, traditionally um, we we select excipients that do have, um, you know, it is a melting process, um, but we typically select excipients that have relatively high melt points. Um, so our 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 standard formulation um, starts to soften around 50 to 55 degrees C, um, and a lot of that is driven around that stability concern. Um, so you know, we still use the standard. Um, 4075 for our, our um, uh, accelerated stability programs, and, and you know, so far we've actually had relatively good success in terms of both physical stability, chemical stability, and performance. So, um, in general, LMPs are, are a very stable dosage form for both um, performance and chemical stability. Hey, Brett, the questions keep coming in. Here's another one. Could you comment on the temperature and time of exposure to that temperature during LMP processing? Yeah, so uh, the, the time and, and temperature exposed, uh, the API is exposed to is a key consideration. Um, so uh, with our traditional excipients, we're looking at um, melt temperatures on the order of about 90 C. Um, and so, you know, early in development, what we'll do is, is a melt screen um, looking and, and ensuring that that API is stable at those temperatures. Um, most most a APIs that we've encountered have been, um, but it is something that we, we look for early in the development process as, as kind of a de-risking step. Um, the other thing to consider here, uh, even though the API is exposed to a relatively high temperature, um, the time of exposure is relatively short. So um, for the LMP, ex ex especially when you're using an extruder um, for, for processing, uh, it's really that time at temperature is essentially the residence time in the extruder, which is, is typically on the order of one to five minutes. Um, so it is exposed to relatively high temperature, but that exposure time is relatively short. Um, and in our experience, uh, that particular aspect hasn't really been a, a stability risk, a stability concern. All right, here's another one. What are the main process parameters that you focus on for scaling up the LMP process? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, so one of the beauties of the, the LMP or melt spray congeal process uh, is that there are relatively few scale up considerations. So um, even when we're operating at the, the 20 gram scale, feasibility scale, 
Um, the fundamental atomization process is the same. Both the atomization and the congealing process is the same. Um, so when we're looking to go scale up, um, really we're not changing that many parameters. Uh, it, it's, a, it's essentially a, a continuous process. So um, we're basically increasing run times rather than changing um, parameters. So what we're looking for when we're scaling up is, is really process robustness. Um, so making sure that we're in the atomization regime that gives us the most stable um, um, atomization process and congealing process. Uh, so in terms of, of what we're looking for, um, a lot of it is actually disk speed and melt flow rates. Um, those tend to be two of the key process drivers for, for robustness uh, and when we're looking to move scales or move equipment. Okay, um, what are the advantages of multi-particulate over the oven, other common pediatric dosage forms like oral suspensions and solutions? Yeah, another really good question. Um, so there's there's really two main advantages that, that come to mind. Um, the first with lipid multi-particulates in, in general, or especially versus the, the oral uh, liquids, is stability. Um, so with the oral liquids, uh, you certainly have a dissolved fraction of the API in that liquid form, um, so there is some stability risk there. Um, on the other side, you also have concerns over microbial growth because it is a liquid system. Um, so a lot of those um, issues require uh, preservatives and, and solubilizers, which uh, specifically for the pediatric population are, are kind of falling out of use for regulatory um, reasons. Uh, so that, that's one huge advantage of, of lipid multi-particulates um, over the, the liquid, suspension, liquid suspensions or solutions. Um, the other one is the ability to um, hide the taste, so taste masking. Um, with, with liquids, you're really required on either sweeteners or flavorings to try and mask um, bad taste, where with the lipid multi-particulates or any multi-particulate in general, um, they have a, a inherently taste neutral profile, um, and then any API, negative API characteristics can be readily um, uh, mitigated through taste mask coatings or other taste masking technologies. So, um, those, so both the, the taste masking and also the um, stability and, and preservative uh, concerns are, are the main drivers of why you choose a, a multi-particulate over um, an oral liquid. All right, Brett, thank you for tackling so many questions. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Any questions that you submitted that Brett was unable to answer today, he can answer via email. Um, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge with us today, Brett, and thanks also to Kat Sajil for sponsoring today's event. We have a post-webinar survey on the right side of your screen. If you could take a minute to give us some feedback on today's event, we'd be most grateful. Um, this webinar will be available on demand later today. And you can view it again or share it with your colleagues by visiting AmericanPharmaceuticalReview.com. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.